Julie, here we are, Kendall and Cooper talking mysteries again. Great. Well, welcome to Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries. I'm Julie Cooper, as you probably guessed, half of the duo, including Wendy Kendall, bringing you this regular podcast series focused on mystery, suspense, and thriller fiction. I know Wendy's anxious to grill our special guest, but first, quick thanks to my brother, Chris Squires, for his original composition and performance of our theme song, that nefarious character, the man in the Panama hat. Because we're well into November, and this episode will be posted just before Thanksgiving, I thought it'd be appropriate to focus on gratitude as our theme for today's show. We're all so busy these days, most of us don't really take the time to say thank you. Yet, when I've made an effort to send a handwritten thank you note, a special remembrance, a personal email, or a phone call, the results have been profound. I guess that tells you how increasingly rare it is these days to take the time to properly thank someone, or even just to show up. We all seem to be busy being busy, and oddly, we're proud of it. Are we missing out on engagement and human connection because we're all so focused on our mobile technology? Sometimes I wonder. Before I introduce our esteemed guests, listeners and writers have sometimes asked us how we select interview subjects for our podcast. A few writers have asked us if we can interview them on the show, so I guess being asked is a good thing. So far, we've primarily restricted our interviews to commercially published authors, whether seasoned veteran writers or newly published authors with a unique take on things. So how do we find guests to interview? Well, Wendy and I look at a wide variety of sources, from members of Mystery Writers of America and International Thriller Writers Organizations, to Oprah's book picks, to writing and publishing blogs, and to recommendations from brilliant librarians like Nancy Pearl and others whose opinions we trust. We set the bar high because we want to bring you quality programming. We know that if you've made it through being commercially published, you've worked hard at improving your craft and you've made it through what is a daunting maze of agents, editors, and publishers, and readers too. So for that writer who asked us to read and review his book, oh, and if, by the way, it drags in the beginning, just skip ahead to chapter four and then give him a good review, the answer is no. And if you send me your book for free, will I read it and review it? No, thank you. We recognize our audience's reading time is valuable. They're golden hours. And we're grateful that you spend some of that time with us instead of binge watching Game of Thrones. We want to make sure that you, we give you the best possible insights, interviews, resources, and recommendations. And now to introduce our special guest. She's been called the reigning queen of espionage thrillers, and she's a co-founder of International Thriller Writers Organization. Publishers Weekly compiled a list of the top 15 espionage books, and her book is number eight, right there in the midst of books by Ken Follett, Jean Le Carré, and Daniel Silva. A very big deal. She's been awarded the Military Writers Society of America's Founders Award, among many, many awards and nominations. She's a New York Times bestselling author of multiple spy and international intrigue novels, including her newest book, The Assassins. It's my pleasure to welcome a writing mentor, a writing inspiration, the wonderful Gail Linz. Welcome. Thank you. What a lovely introduction. Well, we're Our pleasure. Yeah, we're very excited to have you, Gail. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, my goodness. I <laughs> I feel very welcomed and I'm grateful to be here. I'm excited about our talk today. Well, I've enjoyed reading your work and I also had a good time visiting your super interesting website, gaillins.com. There's so much interactive information there, including test your spy cue. <laughs> I, I just couldn't resist that. So <laughs> I took the How fun. Did you do? <laughs> well, I didn't score high enough to be ready to serve or to be recruitable, but my score showed potential candidate. So I've got yeah. potential. <laughs> nice. Potential is good. <laughs> yeah. Uh. 
I think that's pretty good for a cozy mystery writer. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> well, I have found cozy mystery writers, they can be quite de uh, deceiving and deceptive and uh, they can have really wonderful plot twists. So that's the, all part of the undercover business. We do have our own secrets. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I definitely encourage our listeners to enjoy the activities and information on uh, gaillins.com. And also on the website, there's a photo tour of your Book of Spies book, uh, London to Rome, Istanbul to Athens. And I love those photos. But I will say that uh, your written descriptions of settings are very visual and they place me right in the action in your books. How hard is it to include description in action-packed stories and how important is it? Oh, yeah, wonderful questions. I, 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 one can have nothing but nonstop action and some people really enjoy that. But my experience is that um, you need to stop and be able to take a breath. I want to know where I am. I want my feet on the ground. I want to be able to smell the, the smoke in the air or maybe newly cut grass. These things help us as readers to be rooted in the story so that we can live it more, more easily. Living a story is really critical to me and that's what the reader the reader brings his or her experiences to it and my job as part of um, telling the story is to offer descriptions that put you firmly in place so you don't have to think about it you know where you are and that way you can follow the characters and what's going on well I definitely was following every step I'll tell you <laughs> Good. <laughs> when you write your spy characters, what traits do you prioritize in your depictions to make them so believable as spies instead of like caricatures? Oh, yeah, that's that's something that uh, I haven't thought about for a long time. So thank you for asking me. Um, I, I look at them as human beings. They're, believe it or not, even though they're highly skilled, and uh, Langley is called the campus because of the uh, collegiality, the college, the university sense, because there's so much learning, investigation, curiosity, figuring things out going on all the time. They're really human beings. Some of them are smarter than others. Some of them are um, have families. Others don't. Some of them have been traumatized in life. Some of them have not. So you have a, a, a wealth of of human beings who work at um, in the intelligence com community, in terms of being undercover, well, that does that requires other skills. You have to be a self-starter. You have to be able to live alone, because people who cannot live alone are usually not usually, but often blurt out things. They they want communi communication so much with other people that they say things they should not say, they reveal things they should not reveal, and they can be very um, ineffective and lose their lives if, if they can't keep their mouths shut, they can't live alone, if they can't put on the mask of someone else and pretend to be someone else. They have to have a good memory. They have to be willing to put up with hardship. They have to be willing to put up with time away from family and friends. So you can see there are a lot of issues that, I think most people are unaware of the, the dedication and the sa sacrifice that goes into working undercover. But having said all that, they still have issues. Some of them do have um, PTSD or, or the effects of trauma that they're periodically dealing with. Some of them have lost loved ones that they still carry the sadness of. Uh, some of them uh, may may not have achieved something in life and ended up going into the intelligence community because it made sense to do it, but they lost something along the way. And all these things, these pluses and minuses, um, the the depth, not the superficiality, but the depth of us as human beings plays into um, how I think about my characters and as they come to me. Oh, I, does that make sense? <laughs> I, it does. That's, that's beautiful. And, and as you're speaking about these people, too, it really, you know, it just 
triggers for me because you with your background you know you really know them uh you know in real life and so being able to portray that on the on the page that that's a lot of work it's also a lot of of talent i think too so to be able to a lot of years, a lot of years under my belt <laughs> Well, here's a quote from your book, The Assassins, that I felt shows one of the many, many effective ways that you get your reader into a scene quickly. So the quote is, it did not look like the Wild West, but it had the feel of it. And then you go on, <laughs> I love this, about how the character Judd and uh, the character he's with Boza, um, treat the coat check slash weapon check guy at the nightclub, which it just got my imagination going. But here's the quote. Judd simply nodded and handed over his Beretta and a $50 bill. Boza finally, finally handed over his Walther to the young man. I'll kill you if it's not waiting for me undamaged and unused. As a, as a thriller action writer, you really know those two characters. How well do you have to know those characters? <laughs> well, not so well that they don't surprise me. How's that? <laughs> because um, Bosa at that point uh, really, <laughs> that just came out of his mouth. He, <laughs> he was irritated. He'd had a long day and uh, he, he, usually was much more smooth than that but i think he was fed up <laughs> <laughs> i just love it there's times when you just you just get the that you just get the reader right into the core of your character i love it <laughs> thanks <laughs> in cozies which is what i'm most familiar with the amateur sleuths are solving mysteries with sort of their common sense and some specialized skills that they may have in developed just kind of intrinsically through a hobby or a job that they do. Um, but I was fascinated by the detailed training that we see that your, your characters can execute in the field. And I'm not just talking about knowing their weaponry. I mean, they know that too, but also just knowing how to effectively fight with their hands and disguise their appearance and disguise their mannerisms and there's and more. So what are the challenges in writing those fight scenes and and also the challenge of not letting disguises and aliases confuse your reader? Oh yeah, that, that it's one of the worst things an an author can do is to confuse the reader. Um Readers have a, a low boiling point on that. Uh, after, If they're confused enough, they walk away. And honestly, I'm the same way. If I get confused or bored, I don't finish the book. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. And I'm glad you weren't confused. Not at uh, all. Oh, good. Uh, because the assassins, of course, follow six different assassins, one after another. And uh, I worked really hard. So, the re so each one was a standout, so you knew exactly who you were reading about uh, as I moved from one to the other. So in terms of the um, skill set, the trade craft, uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time, and I am fortunate to be a, a visual uh, writer. I can see these scenes in my mind, and uh, I have a really good book on... Um, karate and some of the other um, combat um, trade craft things that I'm going to need so I can always refer to make sure that I'm I'm still doing it right because I make mistakes and I get so annoyed and it's usually because I've taken for granted that I know something and I didn't double check myself but there are some basic things I get it's interesting because I do get email or at a where I'm an event somebody will ask me how how can I what book can I read so that I can write a book uh set in the world of espionage <laughs> like one book is going to uh, I, I think you can see behind me my library it goes all the way to the ceiling and 99 percent of it has to do 
uh, with intelligence and espionage and geopolitics and geography and, you know, just everything that you could possibly be wondering about if you were writing one of these books. So there's a lot of um, research that goes into what I do. But again, I go back to the basics. I'm fortunate, I am fortunate to be a visual writer. And not every writer is. I don't know how they do it if they can't see it in their head, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could get that. Um and let me show you something. Let me. I'm going to back up here a moment. I'm going to grab a book. Uh, I was looking for something the other day. For our, for our listeners, just to let them know, they don't get the treat of seeing you on the visual on the Skype like oh. I do. Uh, that's something that we'll have to get to on our Kendall and Cooper podcast. But I don't think I'm quite ready for the big screen yet. <laughs> Okay. Well, then never mind, because this, the, I'm, what I'm showing you, and this is a fraction, I have books that have tabs up the yin-yang, because I have read the book, I've yellow highlighted it, and then I put little tabs on the pages that I think are even more important. So uh, I didn't realize that you couldn't see me. <laughs> well, I, well, I can see you, and there are a lot of tabs in that very thick book, and and you do have a wall of, of books behind you. <laughs> floor yeah. to ceiling so i can see the amazing research that you do it's but like, you know for me it's it's i love it and um i i uh, my previous husband who passed away i'm i'm married again to a wonderful man but my previous husband was a an edgar winning detective novelist oh, and he oh. yeah and he hated to research this man hated it whereas me i'm buried in my books my magazines my clippings but you know he could see scenes in his head too he was very visual he disliked the research so i'm only saying that because everybody has their own strengths as writers and to play to those strengths is important oh that's good advice well, millions of readers are hooked on spy novels and in the past you've quoted j edgar hoover there's something about a secret that's addicting. Does that refer to being in on a secret or in finding out someone else's secret? And how is it that you bring those secrets to life for your readers on the page? There's another one, a quote that I love uh, from Gates, uh, who was at one time head of CIA and then, of course, became our um, defense uh, secretary. Um, when a spy smells flowers, he looks around for a coffin. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I love that. So it's all about the secrets. And secrets refers to those that one knows or those that one finds out. Because it doesn't matter. If it's a secret, it's got power. Secrets are um, just naturally very powerful. And that's one reason why, and I don't hear this much anymore, but the intelligence community used to be called the fourth leg of government. For instance, uh, the White House is one, um, one leg, uh, the Supreme Court is another leg, and then Congress is the third leg. But without the intelligence community, uh, Congress and the White House really can't make policy and act on um on on bills and ideas if they don't have proper in, um, uh, information. And that's why uh, the intelligence community is so important and their job is to find out all the secrets they can possibly find out. So po secrets are powerful. Recently, you spoke to students at your alma mater high school, sharing writing tips and more with them. <laughs> How wonderful. And you talked about the hard work of writing and specific skills that need to be practiced, as well as the need for rewrites. And you've, you've sort of given us, our listeners now today, a little taste of the work of writing. But can you share with us a little more about maybe what you shared with these young people? Oh, yes. These are, <laughs> these are the little sayings that keep us going as we're uh, writing a book because we all have periods I, when we write and I still do to this day where I think the book is just, you know, sucks. It's awful. <laughs> Why did I ever think I could be a writer? I'm just, you know, I want to crawl under my desk and suck my thumb. So 
That makes me feel so much better, Gail. So much oh, better. You Lord, have no idea. It doesn't stop. I thought it would stop. <laughs> no, it does oh. not stop. Okay, so here's one of my favorite ones. Writing is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. Oh, boy. Doesn't that give you a sense of, well, this kind of makes more sense. It's uh, Writing is really hard work. It's uh, I can't remember who, who said this, but it's ditch digging of the brain. I mean, we, we're digging ditches. We're just using our brains to do it. And so much of it is routine because we have to know what we're doing. We have to know what we're talking about. Uh, we have to come up with interesting stories that people will want to read. So there's a lot of day labor involved. The, the fun, of course, I think for most of us is in the writing. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I, I, I mean, it is sometimes not fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but um, but that does make me feel better because sometimes I, I see, you know, other writers uh, getting finished and getting published and all that and I and I'm still I feel like I'm still way behind and that makes me feel better because it I I feel like I'm a slow writer you know but but maybe it is just hard work for me <laughs> and it's hard work for them too but I'm not seeing their hard work you know there are there are things that slow a writer down and some and many of them are important they're good and and one should not dismiss it um there are writers who who write a book a year or two books a year but they usually are writing very not not that they're not as much love because they are uh simpler books yeah. they are, have a much more straightforward plot line it's a to b to c to d and they are what? I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> that, no that problem. That was unfortunate. No, no uh, problem. Um, uh, anyway, their, their plot lines are simpler. They don't do as much research. Um, and also, there are, there are pluses and minuses to serious, serial um, characters. Uh, but one of the pluses of a serial character is that you know that character. Your ch one's challenge is to develop the character in new ways in each book. But at least you start with a character that you know. So there are reasons why some people are capable of writing more quickly. Uh, Nelson DeMille just announced, I guess, a friend was telling me, um, I like Nelson a lot, uh, he said that uh, he there's no way he could ever write a book a year because he has to spend so much time thinking about it, constructing the characters, constructing the plot, and doing the research. I do think that writing is very much like driving a car. When you first start out, you don't, I mean, there's so many things to think about. There's the brakes, uh, there's the the foot feet, there's the, the rear view mirror, there's the side mirrors so, and sometimes they're beeping things at you and talking things at you you're having to pay attention to an awful lot of stuff and it right. in the beginning it can seem overwhelming but then after a while you know you look out on the road and you think well not everybody uh, is smarter than me maybe i'm smart enough to figure this out and you do learn to drive and after a while you notice that a lot of the things that you're doing as a driver are automatic pilot right yeah that's true and writing, to a certain extent, can become like that. And that's why when you are, you guys are challenging me with questions, you're basically asking me things that I'm not thinking about now. Yeah. There was, there was a time when I spent a lot of time thinking about these things, and that can slow you down too. So, it's better. Look, if I have learned one lesson in writing, it's much better to have a really good book. That matters. And you can have a really good book if you take the time to do it. And I also highly recommend um, working with a writing group or a writing partner so you have someone to brainstorm with, to play off the quality of your work, to send something out and not be certain that it is the absolutely best is sort of like a, a death wish. Spend the time. It, it, it's worth it. 
um, you, and there's another saying, here's one that I, I also love, and I tell my children this too, because this is true of just about every profession out there, including ditch digging. If you're not getting rejected, you're not trying hard enough. Oh. <laughs> so good. collect those rejection slips with pride. <laughs> I must be an overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is very encouraging, actually. I, I can see why uh, why Julie feels like you're so inspiring as a mentor. It's very encouraging, actually. The, I wanted to talk for a moment about an interesting romantic relationship that you have in your book, The Assassins. It's between uh, two characters, Katya and, uh, forgive me, Peter. listeners, I don't know how to pronounce this, P Piotr? Peter. Oh, I Just can no he, he does. He pronounces it Peter. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> okay. but, it's, but it's a Russian spelling. Um, what are the advantages and the challenges of having romantic attractions in a spy novel? Well, they're, it's part of real life, even undercover, even even if you're a covert officer or, or, a, or a handler or an analyst. Um most people are not alone, even when they are working undercover. Either they have somebody back at home or they have inadvertent relationships, affairs, or even something lasting that comes from the job. So I, I you know, I've heard the controversy over this, but to me, it is unrealistic not to address this issue. For instance, in the last Spy Master, uh, one of the relationships is with Jay Tice, who uh, was one of the foremost spy masters in the Cold War. And it's, it's shortly after the Cold War, and he has never forgotten his long lost love from who was in the Stasi, and it was a Cold War romance, frowned on and dangerous to both of them. And then after the Cold War was over, they each went their separate ways for different reasons, but he's never forgotten her. And towards the end of the book, they're able to get together and work together to resolve the, the problems that have been thrown at them and um, you know make the world a little better place at the end. So th it, it happens in real life. So why, why wouldn't I address it? <laughs> That's a good point. Um, you have brother, you have brothers in your assassin, the assassins, Eli and Danny Eichlin. And at one point, Eli says, Danny had become a serial killer. He'd murdered three men in Tel Aviv and a woman in Jerusalem. He was fascinated by the mechanics of execution, but he needed to learn to do it right and to make money at it. Otherwise, he wasn't going to survive. I've always taken care of my little brother. Could you tell us a little about creating these very interesting sibling killers? <laughs> <laughs> kind of question that I always think in the back of my head, you know, there's, there's sort of a trope that all characters in a book are the author. Oh. <laughs> oh. And, and so, so there's a sort of fear of lunacy, a <laughs> crippled mind crippled intent on my part when I, when I think about, but you know, I really love Danny and, and Eli because they did have such an unusual relationship. And here, I think Danny was, I mean, I'm sorry, Eli was, and he's former Mossad. He was uh, all the assassins, well, not all of them. Most of them came from uh, intelligence agencies around the world. And in his case, he's, he's Mossad, he was Mossad. And uh, by then, I think I had created two or three of the assassins, and I was running out of steam. How to make this one different, Eli, how to make him different. And then all of a sudden, I realized, I was thinking about relationships, and I realized he has a relationship. It's just an unusual one. And that's when Danny came. And uh, I think Danny started talking to me, to, on the, started talking on the page before I began to understand that he was an um, unusual character in a, in a kind of a way. He's an idiot savant, uh, probably autistic. Uh, I can't remember whether I actually gave him a diagnosis in the book. Yeah. I did? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. 
I mean, not official, I, but it comes up, comes across on the page. Good, because uh, the, he he's utterly devoted to Eli, and I, Eli has given up everything for Danny. So this this kind of um, trusting and loving relationship between two killers is um, uh, it goes against what we like to think about killers, uh, sp- particularly professional killers, hitmen or uh, assassins, professional assassins. And that is that they're all alike. They're all monolithic. They're all sociopaths or psychopaths or both or this or that. So what happens if that doesn't, they don't fit the mold? And that's what interesting who are the, story. there was these assassins, um, did I, could I make it believable? Did I believe? It? And then uh, I got a lot of um, crap from people who, not from a f- couple of people who said, well, that's impossible. They, they all are sociopaths. They all are psychopaths. And I was talking to a, a psychiatrist friend of mine later who said, no, there's a spectrum. And they are all, they can all be different. So I, I finally got somebody who would tell me that I was correct in you know what I had deduced from my own research, and yeah, thank you for bringing those two characters up. They were uh, uh, they were so intriguing to me, and as a reader, I'll tell you they were very realistic. Uh, I I mean I I uh, believed them completely, uh, and and I was so interested in them. I mean it gave a level of interest to them that maybe some of the other assassins I didn't have. Yeah, that's, listen, everybody brings something different to the book. Uh, others, other, other readers really loved uh, Katya and Peter, and, and then there's a carnivore, you know, what do you think about him? Yeah. So, I mean, everybody yeah. relates to different characters in different ways, let me put it that way. Well, the different sections that you have in the book, you start out with some thought-provoking quotes on each of them. A couple of them that really hit me, uh, by one single assassin on foot, a king may be stricken with terror, though he own more than a hundred thousand horsemen. That's from an old Ismaili poem in praise over the Fadawis (laughs) by 13th century Persian poet. And another one, uh, as an example, to say that assassination never solved anything is as inaccurate as saying crime never pays or that all assassins come to a bad end. And that's from the Book of Assassins, George Featherling. Yes. Is, is it that idea of the effectiveness that intrigued you to write on the topic of assassins? Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, that really pulled me in. But what actually what happened was I had been writing about spies for so many years, and there were always, almost always, uh, assassins of one kind of, or another, either employed by government or freelance, as these six assassins have become. And I, I all of a sudden realized, you know, I'm, and I, I live in fear of repeating myself. <laughs> and so that meant, okay, what can I do that's new, that's different for me, and that might might intrigue readers. And that's when I decided, why don't I focus on the assassins? I had Judd and Eva from the Book of Spies, and I thought they were really great characters. And I wanted to find out what would happen next to them, because in a, in a funny way, of course, they reverse roles. Yeah. In, yeah. Yeah. And um, so, but if, but I, I needed more than two main characters for a story. So that's when I came up with the idea of having several assassins and investigating who they were, which means that, and I had to have them work together at least once. But Lord, I tell you, that was one of the most difficult books I have ever written because it was with every assassin, I had to tell a new story. And I had to tell it in such a way the reader would not be bored and I wouldn't be bored. And it had, the story had to relate to the plot, take us all the way to the end where we meet the, the sixth assassin. Gail, I'm going to implore, would you mind, could you get our hearts pounding and our minds cranking with a reading from one of your works? Oh, my gosh. Sure, I would love to. Hold on. Oh, (laughs) yes. Oh, 
All right. I can see you on Skype. You're searching your bookshelves. Yeah. I love that. I forgot to pull something down. I am so sorry. Oh, good. <laughs> You're going to pull it in right now. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, one of the things that... um. This is from the big, from the second chapter of the book. The night air stank of oil fires. Gunfire crackled in the distance. Watchful, the assassins waited in the night shadows at the museum's rear security wall. They were dressed like locals in loose shirts, western trousers and gutras, cotton scarves, wrapped around their heads and across the lower parts of their faces. Only their eyes showed. They checked their watches. At precisely 12.10 a.m., the door in the wall opened, and General Mole Alwar appeared. A tall blade of a man with refined features, he wore the uniform of the Special Republican Guard. But his shirt was unbuttoned, he was, a, he was capless, and his eyes were overbright. His Kalashnikov dangled carelessly from one hand. Merida, he snapped in Basque. Shit, he's lost it. The Russian shoved the general back into the compound and the others rushed after, weapons up, ready for trouble. The last man bolted the door in the security wall. The general shook off the Russian and stared anxiously around at their scarf-hidden faces. Show me who you are here, Burley Morgan. I need to be certain it is you and these are your people. You bloody wanker, it's us all right, Morgan unpeeled his gutra, revealing corrugated skin a fighter's broken nose, and a neatly trimmed silver mustache. Morgan was the oldest, in his early 60s, but he still had a tough look about him, as if with the crook of a finger he could hollow out the eye of any of them. The general stood a little straighter and gave a deferential nod. It's good to see you at your service. Although there was no trust in the venal business of international wet work, occasionally there was respect. And Burley Morgan was respected. Other top independent assassins would accept a job from him, which was why Saddam Hussein had hired him to put together a team for a series of particularly sensitive international terminations. Besides Morgan, the Basque, and the Russian, there were a former jihadist, a retired Mossad operative, and a peripheral member of La Cosa Nostra. They had executed their assignments perfectly. The problem was Saddam had never paid the second half of what he owed them. How's that? That's great. I love that. <laughs> so thank, good. Thank you so much. Julie, I've been hogging our guest. I know you've probably got questions too. I'm going to have to relinquish. <laughs> I do. I do. I'm going to jump right into those. Gail, I know you began your writing career as an investigative reporter for a newspaper that's near and dear to my heart, the Arizona Republican. Yeah. 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 How yes. did that background and that training shape your fiction writing style? Well, it was so funny because I swear that half the people in the newsroom had what we used to call in those days a novel in the drawer. In other words, if they ah. could just get the time, they would go home and write. But, you know, heck, daily daily news to cover, features to cover, deadlines, etc. So they never got the book written. <laughs> Uh, yeah. um, but I loved it. because uh, I, I was a general assignment reporter. It was my first job out of uh, university. And uh, I was in the governor's office. I did some investigative reporting about some um, homes uh, for institutions for mentally retarded adults, which uh, I figured out uh, through my investigation that uh, the state was paying the homes X number of dollars, but the homes were spending less than that. So what was happening to the money that wasn't being spent? And that led to a change in um, state law so that that kind of uh, shenanigans, uh, bookkeeping shenanigans couldn't happen again. Um, so, I, it, and I love deadlines. Uh, I love meeting them. Uh, I love the sense of everyday excitement. So I, you know, for me, it, it was my way of saying I can't write novels. I'm just a kid from Iowa. I never knew anybody who'd ever written a novel. And so I had no idea I could do it myself. So that was my 
entry into the professional world of writing. And it, it really, because I was able to do it and do it well, it really did give me a lot of confidence for when I did want to, for when I finally did pull out my college typewriter and start start on my first short stories. Okay, good. So it was good training. It was excellent training. All right, all right. Now, I understand that your first fiction writing was literary short stories, but I also know from reading about your, your bio that you were also producing um, what is kindly called male-oriented pulp adventure novels, including <laughs> Nick Carter and the Mac Boland series. Yep. I'm wondering, as a writer, were you feeling a little schizo or a little um, divided with this approach? Can you tell us more about this unconventional path? Oh, I just loved it. I really did love it. Um, I, I was going through a divorce then, and I had written uh, one straight novel that was unpublishable. I'd written a mystery novel that was unpublishable. And but I had found sort of found my voice in literary fiction. I didn't know that that was what it was. I honestly didn't know. I was writing short stories, and uh, I went to Santa Barbara Writers Conference, a very fine writers conference, and showed them to a teacher there. And she said, "Well, I, she said I can't help you with this, but I know what it is." And she said, "These are literary short stories." And I went, "Oh." <laughs> So I started <laughs> submitting. I started submitting, and and the, some and little and the the literary journals picked some of them up and published them. And meanwhile, I was dating Dennis Lands, my second husband, the one who passed away, the mystery writer, and he was able to get a contract for our Nick Carter's. And my golly, they paid nothing. They paid thirty five hundred dollars flat fee, and you know. <laughs> And he said he knew I was broke because I was getting a divorce and um, I had not really worked in years. I'd been raising my children. So and, you know, when you get paid in copies of the literary journal and you have kids who are accustomed to eating, uh, yeah. paper is not a food group. So I right. had to come up with a <laughs> way to make a living. And this, and even though that was only 3500 bucks, at least it was income. So he asked if I could write them. And I just lied. I said, sure. Ah. <laughs> okay. And uh, he, was, he was very good because he helped me. He taught me so much. And I taught myself because they allowed me to do things like experiment with voice, experiment with viewpoint. Uh, I learned a lot about descriptions. I could set them all over the world. Uh, they never thought the contracts were in Dennis's name. Women were not writing these books. They were not allowed okay. to at that time. So uh, wow. the, all the contracts were under his name. How about that? <laughs> the old days. Okay, things have changed. So it was a, it was a, and and I, I'm sure you have, you know a lot about the controversy between being. Which is better, uh, literary work or genre work? Uh, which, and I, honestly, I just get so tired of it because I I was going to Breadloaf and I was going to the Santa Barbara Writers Conference, and Santa Barbara Writers Conference was popular fiction mostly, and Breadloaf, of course, is literary fiction mostly. So I said I don't understand why I can't write really well and write in a field where I can, I hope, reach a lot of readers. And so I, that's just what I did. I think it's silly. A, book, a good book is a good book is a good book. I so agree. It's all about the story, truly. And, and, and good writing. As you know, I mean, the one of the reasons you take time with your books is that you're honing, you're polishing. And that matters. I completely agree. Yeah. Now, Julie's, I know you. Julie's a really good. Oh, thank you so much. I know you've worked with some members of the intelligence community and have invested a lot of time and resources in vetting certain details in your novels. Can you tell us a little bit what that experience is like for a writer? I've been very fortunate because my one of my one of my first jobs was as an editor at a think tank, which is where I had top secret uh, security clearance. And uh, so I met people going through and I was working on documents. It was um, it was a wonderful entree into the world. And then after that, I made friends. And uh, there, was, there was a wonderful thing 
uh, Bob Ludlam used to say, because people accused him all the time of, you know, having been CIA. I get accused too. Um, and I and I will say what he said, and that is, um, I know people and I have an imagination. <laughs> so, I like that. I like that. Yeah. So I have resources. <laughs> and then I make, and then I lie. <laughs> How's that? Okay. All right. That works for me. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're finally starting to see a significant number of strong female protagonists or co-protagonists in thrillers, a subject near and dear to my heart. What do you think is the next evolution of the thriller protagonist? That is a tough one. I think I, I'm seeing thrillers divided into several different categories right now. There is the, the vigilante th thriller uh, where... Uh, it's almost always a male main character uh, has his his or his own inner sense of what is right and wrong. Justice doesn't so that would always be like a, like a Jack Reacher kind of character. Yeah, to a certain extent, uh, but okay. I don't I don't consider uh, him as much of a vigilante because the way Lee is writing those books, uh, Jack is usually put into a corner where he doesn't have a choice. It's him or them. Sure. So that's that's a that's, a, that's a, a an ethical uh, situation in which I try to I I also do that too. I, I'm I'm talking about well you know the movie's Death Wish. Uh, that's kind of an yeah. old um, reference, but it's a very good example. Uh, Brian Garfield, a friend of mine, wrote the novel in which the main character at the end. Um, I think he dies rather than become a vigilante. But then the movie, what, the script, he did, Brian didn't write the, the uh, script. Someone else did and turned the Charles Bronson character into a killer. So he goes around killing everybody that he thinks has been bad and done bad things. And they have, but he, he takes justice into his own hands and kills people. And that's a vigilante story. So I'm seeing a certain amount of that. I'm also seeing a lot of military thrillers, which I often they can be very good. Uh, I'm seeing um, uh, this uh, sort of a um, geopolitical thriller that has touches of undercover work, but it's mostly geopolitical. And then I'm seeing the kind of books that I write, which are really espionage novels that are about power and geopolitics. Uh, so I don't know if that helps, but I I don't think I don't think that's going to change for a while. I uh, thrillers by and large are still very popular, um, and the way they are written matters in terms of what feel what a marketing field they're promoted in. But still, a good thriller is a good thriller is a good thriller. I'd have to agree. Now, speaking of Bob Ludlum, you also had the opportunity to co-write three of the Covert One novels with him. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that collaboration worked? Because I, I read, I think, on your website, you said he did not type at all. No, he did not type. He wrote everything longhand. And then uh, he had a longtime typist whose name I can't remember, who I think Mary, his wife, uh, typed the first manuscripts and then they hired someone after he started making money. Um, he, uh, he, it was, it was in the night, late nineties, he jumped publishing houses, uh, and went to St. Martin's and he'd never written a, a series on purpose. The Bourne books were not on purpose. It was just that the one that the Bourne identity was so popular and that he, then he did have a, an idea for a second one so he could bring Jason Bourne back again. But this time he wanted to actually create a series from the get-go. So uh, I was approached because I was being called the female Robert Ludlum. And um, it was, a, it was a, an honor because I had really admired particularly his first six books. He, he was saying and doing things that no one else had done. For instance, he had CIA operating within the United States, even though it was illegal, of course, because it's... Right, it's right. Yeah, okay, so I don't have to explain that. So, um, and his publisher wanted him to change it, and he refused and pushed the book out anyway. And shortly after it came out, 
uh, I think it was the church hearings or one of some congressional hearings in which it came out that the CIA indeed had been operating within the United States. And people have forgotten that. He was he did a lot of really good things. So um, I was making more money but uh, than, than what they offered me, but I took it for the opportunity to work with him. And what uh, he gave, uh, he had a like a five or six page um idea that he'd been asked to create for a potential TV series and it had not sold. So that's what I was given. And a lot of it didn't work. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what happens with initial ideas until you really sit down and work with them to see what can you can do with them. You just have to figure out what you can keep, what you can toss. So I kept the name of the main character, John Smith, J O N Smith. And I uh, kept the idea of a, a virus, but I had to get rid of, of um, he, I think he had John Smith as a, um, as like a medical examiner. And that wasn't going to work for the kinds of work that he would have to do in terms of the virus. And, and, uh, and constructed a plot. And the book was called The Hades Factor. And uh, mm-hmm. Bob, when I finished, it was sent to Bob. He was still alive at that point, And he liked it very much. He made a a couple of, you know, tiny little changes. And uh, he was not crazy about naming weapons. But you know me, I'm doing all the research. So I wanted to name the weapons. Yeah. You got naming right. Yeah. (laughs) And so that's the way it started. And so I did that one. And I did uh, Paris option. Uh, at this and then he died. He died, I think, shortly after Hades Factor was released. And there was so it was one of those periods. And I was it would be only Bob Ludlam who would allow a female co-writer. You notice that that is only a recent phenomenon. It wasn't until I think Clive Cussler and um, uh, maybe Jim Patterson had named female co-authors. They, they, it, all the co-authors before that had been men. So I was the first. And, uh, you know, I was always very disappointed because I was promised that I would get to meet him, would get to work um, one-on-one with him. You know, we'd sit down, work the manuscript right. We'd go on tour together. Uh, it was just, it was, I was promised a lot. And they did not tell me that he was, uh, you know, he was dying. And it was very sad because I didn't want him to die. And uh, so anyway, I went ahead and did a couple more books. And uh, then I walked away. It was it was taking so much of my time, and there were other good writers out there who could continue the series. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for telling us about that. Now, listeners have heard me often on our podcast talk about international thriller writers as an organization and the annual conference in Manhattan. Certainly, on previous podcasts, and I'm planning on attending again in 2018. Yay! Good. Yay. For, for those who want to write thrillers or suspense or think they might like to explore this, this type of fiction, do you think this is a good place for a beginner to start or should they start with a local writing conference? As their oh, first I, step? I, thank you, Julie. That's a wonderful question because I, I, I'm, I'm actually often asked this and I always say the same thing. Uh, adult ed, uh, your local adult ed, um, maybe there's a close, small conference near you, start that way. And then, you know, in a year or so, come to Thriller Fest, come to the two days that are called Craft Fest, where you literally can hear from a who's who of writing stars. Uh, David Baldacci has taught there, Steve Berry teaches there, Lee Child, Lisa Gardner, Sandy Brown, on and on and on, huge names, and they know what they're doing. Now, if you haven't started writing and you just want to come and dip in, do. But if you want to actually put words on paper, I think uh, a weekly class through adult ed is a very good way to start. And then if you're like, Julie, come come to master class, which I teach. It's an all-day, uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. intensive where uh, professional writers like myself – actually work on your manuscript, your first 10 pages. And uh, frankly, I, I love to teach it. Uh, I learned so much from the students. Julie was in a first-rate class, and I still remember her manuscript. Oh, thank you. And that was such an intense process and such a helpful one for me in particular. Good. Very, very valuable. 
And and one last question before we jump into our segments. Can you tell me if you had to name your top three ingredients for a successful thriller, just sort of off the top of your head, what would those be? You mean for a thriller novel? Yeah. For a novel. Um, it's got to be character, story, and plot. Okay. You got to okay. have all three, and I hope, and and I hope like hell you can write. <laughs> <laughs> there it's is a three -legged that legged stool, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, in keeping with our gratitude theme, I'm going to start with how grateful I am for the writers, editors, teachers, and agents who have given me advice over the years especially the words of encouragement from wise women, including and especially Gail, who was my mentor at the Mastercraft Fest this last July in New York City. Thank you, Gail. You gave me the encouragement when I really, truly needed it. And now I have to admit there were a couple of agents I have pitched books to over the years who were not exactly helpful or constructive in their advice. But I'm even grateful for them because rather than discouraging me, they made me more determined to keep going. Essay writer Joe Fassler talks about how writers appear to be masters of deflecting existential despair, which I found both funny and true. Now, he mentions writer Elizabeth Gilbert's idea of what she calls stubborn gladness, a phrase I'm going to keep repeating, a phrase she borrowed from poet Jack Gilbert. She's quoted as saying, my path as a writer became much more smooth when I learned when things aren't going well to regard my struggles as curious, not tragic. It's a matter of perspective, and I think that's a good definition of gratitude, just having the right attitude. I have a couple quotes I'd like to share with you. I write out of gratitude for all the books I have loved over the years. That came from Kevin Brockmeyer. And this one, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. And that was from a Thanksgiving Day Address written by John Fitzgerald Kennedy. So my charge to all of you at the end of what seriously has been a very contentious year, put that gratitude into action. And I'll turn it over to Wendy here. Thanks, Julie. Very nice. I'm going to talk a little bit about treasuring time together. I am so lucky to be able to say I'm grateful for so very many things, both today and in my past. Reading Gail's books, along with the timing of Veterans Day in November, reminds me how very grateful I am for all the people who keep us safe so we can pursue our freedoms in our personal lives. Thank you to all of them. I treasure anything that brings people together for fun, including bringing families together. So I have a couple of fun, interactive group activities to let you know about. Secrets and Spies board game. It's Clue. I know everyone wants to play online games, but this is a great change of pace for people nine years old and older. Yes, now Clue has an espionage-themed mystery board game. This only loosely uses elements of the classic board game Clue, a classic that never gets old for me, Cozy Writer. But in this new version, Clue stands for Criminal League for Ultimate Espionage. Players are international spies trying to intercept and stop Clue's plans for world domination. And the goal is to become the best spy you can. You get points for completing missions and spy meetings, moving around the board to different spy cities as you collect items needed to complete the missions. It's for two to six players, and in particular, Players who find the original clue too easy will prefer this game. And another suggestion, I recently gathered my family for a real treat to go out for a murder mystery dinner. And we had so much fun discovering and discussing clues and suspects together and also enjoyed a delicious leisurely meal together. 
We even got to dress up as if it was a 1920s era. So instead of playing a game, we were a game. <laughs> so if you get the opportunity to participate in one of these, jump in with both feet and enjoy. And of course, another great thing to share with others is book recommendations. Gail, did you have a book recommendation for our listeners? I do, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's called Red Sky, R-E-D, Sky, S-K-Y, by Chris Goff. And it's the second book in her, in her new, brand new series. The first one is called Dark Waters. And it's, it's a standalone, so you can read it without having read the first one. It's a very interesting book because it starts with something that uh, most of us remember, and that is when, when a flight, goes, uh, flight go, went down in uh, northeastern uh, Ukraine a couple of years ago. In this case, it's a Chinese flight, mm -hmm. and there is an American agent on board. The, her the heroine of Red Sky, this is a very strong, wonderful heroine, uh, Reza Jordan, uh, is sent in to uncover what exactly happened and it takes it involves russia it involves china it involves the united states it's geopolitics you bounce around the world it's a, an exciting read i highly recommend it oh very cool all right Good. well one of the many things that's great about friends is that they influence you to try new things so when the ads started coming out for the movie american assassin oh. i a cozy fanatic got very <laughs> excited to see it. <laughs> there were elements in the ad that I've learned from Julie it, that immediately appealed to me, and I highly recommend this movie. If you, if you can see it in theaters, the foreign country's scenery is great for the big screen. Or if you miss that, grab the DVD, because this is a cohesive, gripping story with powerful characters. The acting is tremendous by Dylan O'Brien, Michael Keaton, and many others. I was enthralled from beginning to end, and so was my friend that went with me. Afterwards, we talked about, in particular, how believable it all was. These were not caricatures, which, for example, for me, James Bond has become. This was so believable, and and as in Gale's writing, the characters were multidimensional and driven by motivations so integral to human nature. The movie was based on a book that I haven't read. The book is by one of Julie's favorite authors, Vince Flynn. So I'm thinking his book would also be a great recommendation. But Julie, maybe you can tell our listeners a little something about Vince Flynn and his American assassin story. Sure, it's, it's a series, and American Assassin actually is sort of the origin story for his, his pivotal character, Mitch Rapp, who, let me just say with edited language, um, he can be a mean, scary SOB, but at least he's our mean, scary SOB. And he was trained um, to sort of work um, off the book, so to speak, um, to take care of problem situations um, that the American government really cannot be involved with. So um, this particular book that the film was made from really gives you some insights into how he came to be as a character, which are very consistently played out throughout the entire series. And um, sadly, Vince Flynn um, died at the age of 47 from prostate cancer. So um, since November is also Men's Health Month, I would be remiss in not reminding all of our listeners and readers to um, get things checked out if you have any concerns, go see your primary health care provider. Um, that's a subject that's near and dear to my heart and my family's heart. But um, just a very wonderful writer, um, well-developed characters, um, and a strong female protagonist, actually several strong female protagonists across the whole series. And uh, I highly recommend it if you like thrillers. And I w I'd like to chime in, uh, Julie and Wendy, and say that Vince was a friend of mine, and I admire his books very, very much. I highly recommend them, too. I'm so glad you brought that up. I can't wait to see American Assassin. Oh, you're going to love it. <laughs> it's, it's quite well done, and Michael Keaton is fabulous in that role. Yes. Yeah. Well, my recommendation is a 2017 film called Unlocked 
It's a CIA MI6 thriller set in current day London, screenwritten by Peter O'Brien. And looking at things online, I, I guess it didn't get great reviews, and I'm really puzzled about that and about why I never saw this film in the theaters. Because it has an all-star cast, including John Malkovich, Michael Douglas, Orlando Bloom, and Numi Rapace. And you'll remember her, I think, from The Girl in the Dragon Tattoo, and also an outstanding American actress, Toni Collette. The film features an action-packed plot line with double twists that challenge your assumptions about who's good and who's bad. I also really like the notably strong female protagonist. And yes, there's more than one in this film, starting with Numi's character, Alice, who's a disgraced CIA interrogator who blames herself at the outset for not being able to stop a Parisian terrorist attack in time. Without revealing the plot, because almost anything I say would mess this up for you, there are terrorists, a biological weapon about to be unleashed upon the English population by an American waspy-looking jihad, jihadi, and a lethally talented burglar, along with a terrifying pair of English mastiffs, just possibly the scariest dog since Crujo. Seriously. There's also graphic violence deception on a massive scale, and cold-blooded retribution, but the viewers dragged along for a fast-paced ride. In short, if you like thrillers, everything you want a thriller to be. It's rated R, and it's available on Netflix and on demand. And I think that's it for another segment of Kendall and Cooper Talk Mystery. We'd like to especially thank our special guest, best-selling writer Gail Lind for joining us and telling us about her books and the writing life. We're waiting for more of her tightly plotted thrillers drawn from the shadows of espionage and intrigue. So along with the turkey and stuffing, don't forget to pass the gratitude. Keep reading and keep writing. <laughs> 